Mayfly time is the pinnacle for most brown trout anglers and we're pleased to announce our next Ireland on the Fly Masterclass is focusing on Mayfly tactics with international angler, guide and renowned fly tire Jackie Mann. On Thursday the 25th of April at 8pm, Jackie will be discussing how to make the most of the conditions, the best flies and methods to use, as well as giving his tips and insights from a lifetime of experience. So, to join us for this masterclass on Thursday, 25th of April, just go to www.irelandonthefly.com forward slash masterclass. Tickets cost 10 euros and all attendees will get a copy of Jackie's notes as well as access to the recording of the webinar afterwards. And stay tuned for our masterclasses throughout 2024, covering salmon, rivers, locks, streamers, lures, dries, everything to make you a better salmon or trout fly angler. Helping you to catch more this year, and to learn from the best. For more information, email us on info at irelandonthefly.com. I love the lake. Oh, Jesus, I love it. And on its day, it's better than any Loch Corrib, any Loch Chelan. On its day, it is phenomenal and you could have better fish and the quality of fish is just unbelievable. Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. We might be in the middle of the rain still in April, but Med Aaron has assured us that high pressure is coming next week, just in time for the start of the Mayfly season. Mayfly in April? Well, it does start on Derg from around April the 20th onwards, and it heralds the Mayfly season madness as it subsequently spreads. So just what is the brown trout fishing like on Derg? Well, this week's guest is Shane Kramer from the Gary Kennedy Angling Club on the Tipperary side of the lake, and he gives us some great and honest insights into fishing Derg during Mayfly as well as the rest of the season. But first, Tom, have you ever fished the mighty Loch Derg? No, I haven't, and it's on the as we call it, uh, my small bucket list. Um, my or should, I, I really should put that as an Irish bucket list, I think. That's the best way of putting it. Uh, so, no, I've never fished it. Always wanted to. You have fished it, but not for trout. No, fished it for pike. I would Last few years, I'd go out in December. I always had a thing about, I wanted to, after Christmas, get out of the house. Mm, um, yeah, I would be saying. And I love that week be, be between Christmas and New Year. And um, I'd always try and get out a uh, bit of pike fishing. It's very slow. It's yeah. bloody cold. <laughs> Not yeah. much happening. You know, we did one of the days we got, um, geez, I think it was a 19 pounder. So oh, cool. Yeah. I could be exaggerating. Of course, you know, it was five, six years ago, might have been 10. Oh, pounder. It's, it's, it's since grown to 19 in the years. I don't know. Five or six years. I think there's a formula there. Yeah. Isn't there? There's, yeah, a, there's a mathematical every theory. Every year. Yeah. Every you multiply year. I by X to the power of, you of, know, you know, anyway. Yeah. So anyway, it's a <laughs> big fish. <laughs> I do yeah, have the picture of it, print. so it, it does look not quite 20. It was close to 20. I, anyway, look, it's a big fish. But uh, <laughs> it was, um, so yeah, I used to always go out, love, love going out, and it's a beautiful, beautiful lake. Um, I'd be going mm. out from Killaloo. And it's funny, for something like yeah. I live in South Tip, North Tip, talk to most South Tip people, it's rare they go up north of the county. I know people here have never been to Derg. And they're from Tipperary. Right, yeah, and yeah. I was just struck by the beauty of it. Like, it's just a fabulous lake. Summer, and when I was pike fishing, I was always told you have to come back in the summer for the trout fishing. I've always said it. Uh, and after talking yeah. to Shane, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely one that you want to go back to. But he gives a very uh, clear and honest appraisal of it. Yeah. You know, it, it's challenging. It's tough. It's challenging. But if, um, if you get a Right, if you get the time right and condition right, he says, you know, you'll have mayfly fishing that's equal to anywhere, not better in Ireland. The interesting thing, though, I suppose, is Sheelan kind of is the favourite now, isn't it, for mayfly time? Yeah, yeah. And as a carb man, it must pain you to say that. Yeah, I, I think it is. There's something about Sheelan and mayfly. Uh, it just has that, it has that, um, has the stamp it's the, it's probably the premier mayfly lake in, in the country yeah and i probably kept temper with that because i suppose we here in car mayfly has been great the last couple of years so you know uh, like fishing other times of year has been great yeah yeah it has been good yeah. but you know mayfly has suffered but uh there's a really interesting side tangent we go off on during this episode where we talk about the hatchery on Mount mm. Shannon 
and yeah. the thriving brown trout population and then how it stopped. Really interesting, well worth it. And check out the link I put in the episode notes as well. Um, and it's a bit of a case of what might have been. You know, if mm. anything Shane says, Derg now has kind of become more known for its bike fishing. I think he says there's about 10 full-time pike guides on the lake now. Yeah. And, you know, you'd be lucky to find the brown trout guide on it, which is... There's rem- no actual, there's yeah. no specific yeah. brown trout guide. Which is an incredible turnaround, if you think about it, for what Derg mm. once used to be, as you said. So there's a whole history to it, which I find fascinating. And also the fact that Derg is the the first one that the mayfly hits. Yeah. It's hitting next week. I know it's hard to believe. It's probably pissing rain wherever you are, looking out the window or driving anywhere. It's, uh, the high pressure is coming. So <laughs> we <laughs> will believe uh, and hope uh, Met Aaron have got it right. Um, so look, yeah. it might be times just right for the start of the mayfly. So you never know. Could be worth it. You okay. never know. The stars might know. align. Yeah, it'll be all worth it. So look, let's hear from Shane Kramer now, and he tells us about Loch Derg. It was back probably 30, 40 years ago. Was one of the the great, um, I suppose, game fisheries in the country. Um, the hydro scheme in Ireland across it probably boosted it, um, as they did with the the salmon salmon runs. Um, you know, but um, look, it's still like the, the visitors, like we're lucky enough, we've got the club here that, that uh, writes for a local newspaper and he's always pulling out the archives. Um, he has articles from, you know, the, the 20s, 30s, 40s, where, you know, all these gentry guests were were coming out. Um, like there was a couple of hotels in Killaloo that were looking after the salmon guys, but you also had the guys coming for the Dappen. They were coming to Mount Shannon. Scarif, Drummondier, Gary Kendi, Port Domina, and like, you know, families, Gillies were making a, a, a living out of it. Um, and it was all happening. Like, it was only probably around maybe the 60s, 70s that fly fishing really came to the fore. And even at that, you even talk to some of the older lads now, they'll tell you it's not a wet fly lake, but um, it was all that. And probably the last 10, 12 years, the amount of guys dapping is gone. Um, there's very few lads tapping it, but look, as a trout fishery, I suppose it's 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 the kind of an enigma of a place there. To be honest, there's loads of small fish got, you know, a half pound to quarter pound fish got, you know, and plenty, plenty, uh, you know, a good number of fish around, you know, the pound, three pound mark as well. But there's so much feeding in Loch Dorg. It's at the bottom of the channel system, so really, it's been a sewer pit for all of the peat bogs. Like on the temporary side, it's huge dairy um, industry on it. So again, all those good rivers going into it. Imagine the catchments, the amount of night beds that are coming off it. But like, you will not catch a skinny trout and lock there. They are <laughs> always, it, they're just so nice to eat. I don't really like eating fish, how ironic that is, but um. They're a gorgeous fish to eat. Like the the guys down here that would like eat fish, they wouldn't take a fish from Parab. They wouldn't take a fish from Mask. They'd they'd only eat a trout from here. Um, they're always just a flesh on them. It's gorgeous, you know. And was it Tom? Was it you who said it? Always oh, said it to me, Tom. Uh, fat cows, fat trout. Well, yeah, it wasn't me. It was Ken Whelan. Ken Whelan, sorry, that. Ken Whelan. So, yeah, yeah. He said so. We always said fat cattle, fat trout. So yeah, yeah. So like, it's fairly um. Fairly decent cattle on the shorelines over around um, Loch Derg, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. I suppose like look, um, yeah, like, I suppose the, the fishing on it, like the trout fishing, like again, it was always known as a spent a spent lake, mm. um, a dapping lake and a spent lake. Like Jesus, there wasn't a year like you know back seventies and eighties again before my time, but there was always double figure fish caught on the on the spent, um, wow. all. Every year, uh, without fail, um, and like you, you know, back back in those days, it was able to kind of keep on a keel with the likes of the Carib and, and the other bigger lakes or better known lakes, even like Sheelan. Like um, you know, uh, one of our former club uh, founders, like he had a thirteen pound fish on the DAP in seventy four. There was uh, he had a ten pounder in eighty four. Our biggest fish caught on the fly 
in the club was caught at 94 in May by Bill Hickey, 12 pounds. And like, you know, even I suppose if you look, if you look back through the years, like there's always, and if you see even the Pike guides now that are spinning for Pike, they're getting just absolute beasts of trout, 13, 14, 15, 16 pounds weight, just casting, you know? Yeah. Um, not specifically going out trolling for them. So, yeah, like, look, it, it depends on who you talk to. Some lads say there's no trout in the lake. That's the um, locals. The locals but, tell the visitors that, Shane. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I suppose, look, I've always prided myself. I, I try and tell the truth as much as I can um, <laughs> when it comes to fishing. But um, I suppose, look, really where you see the, where the head of trout is visually is when the pin fry come at the end of May. It is unbelievable. The, the head of trout that's in it um, like there was a morning last year I went out I hadn't done the cane we, we get canis down here as well um, I went out for a morning and the canis I just couldn't travel to the corrib. Um but I went out couldn't find any canis feeders anyway but I sat for three hours watching probably 200 trout absolutely murder and pin fry wow. and if anybody can come up with something yeah. for the pin fry <laughs> they will do more damage than any buzzer ever did um yep. in in my opinion yeah it's it's phenomenal it's it's phenomenal to see it in the evening and in the in the early morning like that was i sat from probably half five in the morning until half eight before i had to come back uh come back in and, that morning and shane actually did you actually try anything on did you throw anything on Oh, I'm sick of trying stuff like I, yeah. I look. I I've asked some of the best lads in the game at this. Um, like I tried washing line stuff. with like going back years. Like I'm, I'm at this twenty years, and there's an awful mm. lot of better anglers than me trying to to do it. Um, we'd say we've tried little little minnows. We've tried to dial backs. We've, we've tried to Peter Rosses with nothing on them, nearly bare to. We've tried all of the pin fries. We've tried all the stuff that the guys in the reservoirs do. Try the stuff that works on, on the rainbows in lane. Yeah. Not a thing. Not a thing. They will not look at it. And, so it's, um, it's easy then, yeah? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, um, I'll put it to you this way. Back in back in lockdown, um, Matthew, he had Matthew Solon. Matthew, Matthew's an unbelievable um, angler. And loves um, the dirt as well. Oh yeah, like and, yeah. and he'd always say it, and I think he said it on your podcast. Like he yeah. he'd rather catch, he'd rather he he'd rather sees a couple of weeks in Durham yeah. than he does all the tropical places. Yeah. That he, he did say that. But match during lockdown, match again probably about three weeks at it, and just got sick of it. He started going fishing for pike. Like <laughs> right. he just got sick of trying it. So that'll just give you give you an idea. Yeah, give you an idea. You're welcome to try it, Tom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. Listen, in my mind, I have a cracked already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, some things, um, you know, that doesn't always transfer over to reality. Yeah, that's you the know. fact. Like, look, I, I, we we do get, like, we get, like, we, we have, it's a, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's a kind of a, it would have been known as a dirty lake with all the eutrophication and all that. But the zebra mussels would have come along. They've definitely in, uh, improved water clarity. I don't know. I still wouldn't be drinking the water out of it. Um, but that has helped the fly fish inside of it, especially during May. Mm. Um, but like, we get buzzers, we don't get olives, but we get an unbelievable amount of sedges. Um, and it's gas. Like you know, guys have got fish on buzzers in April, but you know, it's really. You might pick up a couple of fish and wets, um, but very few lads do that anymore. Um, very, very few lads do that anymore. Um, sedge fishing, I know a few of the guys up the northern part of Lake do a bit of sedge fishing in the evenings in, in August, July and August, with mixed results. Um, again, I've tried it when I was a young fella and had loads of time. I tried all of this and, uh, yeah, just, yeah, it's, it's, they don't, they don't come really they don't come after um may it's yeah, mad it seems to be the case and early may too it's funny you were talking about there about historically but like if you look back historically the three lakes to come to ireland for may for were Derg, Corrib, and sheila 
Yeah. And in that rotation, a lot of the gents could take four weeks off. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. They could and they'd follow the it, would they? And what they would, they would follow it. They would start in Loch Derg, uh, which was always the earliest. We'll talk about that later. And then move up to Cara, which is um, a bit later than than Derg. And then Sheenan was always traditionally one of the latest. Yeah. So yeah. they would knock their, the, you know, they could get the perfect month out of it. Would you still get lads yeah. doing that, actually? Yeah, you still have, like, um, like I know a couple of the guys, like, I definitely know a couple of the guys. Like, we have guys from, we say, we in Chile and area. They'll come down to us the the last week of April, first couple of days of May. Um, the guys from the Corrib don't come down anymore because, obviously, the camp was there now, and that was different the years ago, you know, the, the, the mm. buzzer fishing wouldn't have been there back back years ago but um like uh, there's a, still a couple of guys in the Mount Dannon club that would come down fish their two weeks on Berg and then they go to Chile mm. you know so even we're probably doing it as well a bit more we're a bit more guilty like I I know lads and I've been guilty of it like we would have spent 30 days on it and I know lads that take a full month off wow. and full month off fish lock Berg every day the, the week and I swear to God, I'd, I'd nearly rather do solitary confinement than do that. <laughs> um, but you used to do it, you know, used, when I was young, younger, used to take three weeks off. But there's still guys taking the full month off, like, and we'll give every day out there. And their return might their return might be half a dozen fish, like. That's hard. Wow. Yeah. Hard wow. Very good. So he he buys up the west. Will never be given out about <laughs> bad days when you're getting two or three fish. Ah, Talk to some of our lads, and you know all about it. <laughs> but we've we've said it. We we've, we've always said it like that. Look, if you're able to catch a couple of fish in that bird, prior the first couple of days in Mayfly, you're you'll catch them anywhere because uh-huh. you you have to be patient. It is tough fishing, is it, Jane? Like, and that's why it kind of you need to know yeah, what you're like, at, like. Look, we would have again. I've been lucky enough that um, I've I've been involved with a couple of uh, families that have been really good fishermen, and I've got to know through that family and through the club lads that were kind of I suppose progressive at their time. But like April, April can be really, really good on wet flies here. Fishing the shallows on wet flies can be fantastic, and you don't have to go fancy, just normal wet flies. But um, that again, I mentioned him earlier. Paul came up with a fly, a pearly muddler, and a long shank ten, I think it was. But mm-hmm. Jesus, we we got unbelievable fishing on that. And again, this was before. This was when the stocks were at well, were at its lowest. In over the rocks, you were just meeting loads of trout and getting mm-hmm. good trout on on these things. Eric Babbler with a silver silver pencil rib and a cock robin and one I two of my heaviest fish for, for years upon years were gotten the uh, wet flies in April in on a pearly bibio. Right. Um yeah, yeah. But, like but is, 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 and is that not happening now? Is the fishing not as is the fly fishing, let's say the the general standard wet fly fishing, is it not as good now in April as it was? You if you was if you had the patience to do it, Tom, you'd still meet your fish. Like we travel to Carob, we'll go to Lane, we go, and we might have a great day and meet three or four fish. I guarantee you, if we actually put the same time in on our own lake, we'd probably meet two or three fish <laughs> and maybe get yeah. them. Yeah, actually, it's probably, and you said it there, I mean, carb anglers probably are guilty of not coming down because you can't turn up, but I suppose, like yourselves. Like anglers all over the country, a lot of us are more mobile now. Yeah. Do you know? And maybe like, let's say, you know, that time when you had your good fish in April, you probably wouldn't have fished camp till on Corrib then. Yeah, absolutely. You know? At, uh, well, absolutely. Yeah. Um, mm, yeah. When like, you think of it, like, and I suppose even just to give you that, it, it transport, like the the road network has got so much better now. Like, mm. if you were going to the Corrib from here, like I can get to Headford now in less than an hour and a half. Right. Like if you were going what used to, to take, like, sure, it depended on Loch Rea and Crowell. Like, oh God, yeah, you clear, turn that way, yeah. Clear Galway, yeah. like Jesus Christ, it could take it could take three hours to get as far as Galway. <laughs> An hour and a half now, we can be in Headford. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. if 
you know, I suppose... You have better choice, I suppose, isn't it, Shane? Better choice. And I suppose as, as things have gone on, like, I I suppose me and the guys I fish, we love dry fly fish. So you're not going to get dry fly fishing in April, the end of March, April, on Berg, but you have a great chance of it on the carb or the mask. Do you know what I mean? So that's probably why we were traveling. And um, again, we during lockdown was probably we went back at it again, and we yeah. were getting a couple of fish on it again. But we could only go to five kilometers. Um, God forbid those days ever come back again. But like I suppose we kind of appreciated what we had in our doorstep again. Do you know? Yeah. Um, well, so they they are definitely there to be got. Guys aren't wet flying as much as they used to be. Lads are spinning for trout on the light tackle, and they're getting plenty of fish. So well, actually, I, I think that's taking that because place. Just before I came on there, and you missed this, Jared. We were just chatting there, Shane and myself, and uh, you do a fair bit of spinning for the trout now in the wet fly areas, don't you? Yeah, like I suppose. Um, yeah, it, it just it, it's gas. Like, there's areas on the lake that you'd say, right, if you're going for a day's wet fly fish, go, oh, yeah, these are my six or seven drifts, or depending on what way the wind direction is going. And then you'll do a couple of size violets or whatever. And inadvert, you know, inadvertently, you'd probably get a couple of fish. Um, since the spinning came along, you're going back to the same places that we were doing all the wet fly fish and you're meeting the fish again. So, I've no doubt in my mind. Like, I've only ever fished a humongous twice on the lake. And we've got fish in a humongous. And I know the guys have cheated. Oh, wow. Oh, Do you know what I mean? No. So, like, yeah. realistically speaking, there is definitely oh. a good bit of fish to be got earlier in the year. But I suppose it's just there's not as many guys at it. And the younger generation are definitely doing more casting. Has Dirk got more of a reputation now for pike? And what do the trail anglers uh, feel about that? Yeah, like I suppose um, it definitely is. Like there's, I put it this way, there's no gillies. Like there's no guides, no gillies. Like there's one or two lads will offer um, a day or an evening on the spent um, biting wise, but that's it. Like there's no trout guides. I, and again, I mentioned back in the 50s, 60s, there was hotels full of guys being taken out to happen. Um, but the, the pike fishing, there's easily 10 full-time guides um, around oh, Dark. Yeah. 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 Yeah, easily. And you have, like, I know you have uh, one or two of the guys from Galway come down as well. You've guys from the Midlands have started guiding now. They're coming over to it as well. So along with the 10 resident guys. And then you've guys that aren't guides and, you know, they're serious into their stuff, like, you know, 40, 50 grand worth of stuff. Yeah, um, they're coming every weekend as well. Like it is phenomenal for pikefish, um, you know, phenomenal. What do the trout guys think? An awful lot of the lads fish for pike down here. That fish for trout, um, yeah. you know, some lads would say there's too many in it, but like I suppose I can remember, like you know, if we're talking about the history of the lake, like the. Uh, the ESB owned the rights, the fishing rights to the lakes since the hydro scheme. And yeah. um, they tried to sell the rights to the fishing the Dutch company in the late 50s. And that set up... Uh, that, Sorry, that, what did they do, Shane? Sorry, they tried to they sell mean? the rights to the fishing for yeah. pike in the in around 57 or 58, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. For the whole lake, like? For the whole lake, yeah. And um, all anglers from around the place, and it was generally led by you know the pro- probably the the gentry, and I suppose all the 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 top kind of solicitor kind of doc, you know the re- the high the the high earner kind of guys at that stage would have been seen as the you know the old gentry. They were probably the the, the drivers too. But then obviously you did your guys in that so Lockburg anglers, you know, a group of anglers from around the lake got together back then and they stopped that but the ESB then funded all the pike competitions they actually what got around the anglers was they, they started putting up really big prices for uh, killing the pike so they weren't going to sell it as a pike fishery so they ran competitions to try and exterminate the pike out of it to make it a game fishery Um. 
so and that went on like Jesus. Look, I could go go on and on, but I suppose in the late nineties, the lake was completely on its knees. Um, like as a club, nineteen ninety eight was our worst year in records. There was forty seven fish caught. Now bear in mind, three quarters of a pound is the limit. Probably about thirty of them, forty seven, that were. Um, you know, maybe over a pound and a quarter. Um, and again, going to a lake that was renowned for double figure fish, like a fish of two pounds seven was the heaviest fish that may. Um, and four, four anglers got 30, I think it was 38 or 39 of that 47. So that, that'll give you an idea. And corresponding with, corresponding with that, then like we had. We October was known as the best pike pike uh, time for competitions. Like there was pike two and three pounds weight winning pike competitions back in the late nineties. Pike are back. The trout numbers seem to be okay, but again, look, I'm not a scientist, but look, there's a there's a couple of things that have happened. I think that have definitely helped the trout numbers, Dara. Um, the so again, I'm, I'm kind of cross-referencing between the ESB and that, but the ESB is part of the Hydro scheme. Their remit was they had to, it, it, it read in the contract, shall look after the fish stocks. Um, so they set up the hatchery in Part Dean Weir to obviously look after the salmon to try and do that, but they also had a trout element to it as well. Like They were driving around with lorry loads of, of out dumping them in, in you know, where you'd have, you know, any bit of deep water to just letting them off. It was grand, but it wasn't really doing anything for the stocks. But um, a club, the Mount Shannon Club, the Mount Scarif Mount Shannon Club, actually set up their own hatchery in, I think it was 2000. Don't quote me on days now, but I think it was around 2000. But by 2002, the fishing on the lake started to increase drastically. Trout fishing on the lake started to increase drastically and it was all fish three quarters of a pound to a pound so in a timeline that these and in the areas where the I suppose the unfed fry were being released into a couple of the streams around the place all that and the mouth and the general area goes that's where all these fish were being got um, and year on year the fish were getting bigger and it was stopped the, the, the fisheries put a stop the scientists put a stop to it and they said uh, they obviously said that they, uh, it it doesn't work, but every club around the lake could find to actual facts that it was working and working unbelievable. I came across an article from two thousand and four on independent independent and the and the headline is fishing revival yeah. on Loch Derg, and it details the trout hatchery. Um, and the success of it, and you know, just saying how you know they got uh, funding from the leader um, uh, yeah. grants, you know, and how well it was doing, and you know how the anglers were thrilled, and you know the future looks bright was actually the last um, sentence. You know, the short term future looks bright for trout stocks on Loch Derg, and then you're saying they were forced them to close it down. Then, yeah, I suppose realistically speaking, when they put every obstacle they could possibly put in their way. And they eventually closed them down. It made no sense whatsoever. In in their minds, you can't argue with science, but I suppose science has been proven wrong decades later in so many things. Um, that it just made no say, sense. Like we, it was a lake that was on its knees. The hatchery they were doing it. It wasn't costing fisheries anything. It wasn't costing the department anything. It was a club looking after it themselves. It was anglers looking after it themselves, funding it themselves. It was costing people nothing our time and those guys put in unbelievable time into it painstaking time into it but, but like you must wonder like if the hatchery was still allowed to continue you know how the lake would have been thriving and you know how much more anglers would have been fishing it for brown trout that you know you wouldn't have had the the pike reputation it would have it might have been gone the other way it could have been you know but it would have compl- it would have complemented each other anyway do you know what I mean it seems to have complemented each other in, in a way anyway, but um yeah, it, it just makes no logical sense. Like, it, you know, the fish stocks down here were just really bad and 
the policy like they were talking about it's not the native strain of fish the ESB were not putting in the native strain of fish in the likes of uh, or, or in Loch Dorg for years do you know and like she you know to, I, I just don't I, I just don't get it and there's a number like again that time I was doing the was they researching all the old place names on the map I was talking to guys in their 70s and 80s now this is 15 years ago like and they were able to tell me rivers that used to be the hatchery. They, they said they were the natural hatcheries of the lake and they were divided fish now. You know what I mean? And um, again, listening to, you know, the, the uh, uh, forgive me there, I can't think of the name of the, the uh, podcast that you're running and that's coinciding with this. But Oh, the last summon, yeah. Yeah, the, the way the guys were saying, like, try a dead river and see. And the inlet signs, but like, you know, look at the Falklands, look at Patagonia, look at Australia, look at Tasmania, look at the States. None of those fish were, were native. They were all stocked. It, it, it's an argument for another day, probably not. A, a... But no, I still find it fascinating. Like, I'm, I think I'll put the link up actually in the show notes just for people to read that story from 20 years ago. Um, because it is like it just struck me, uh, Shane, that the headline in it is fishing revival. The the gas thing about it was like, and um We'll say the, the there was probably about four rivers done with uh, unfed fry. Those areas, as I said, the fishing around those areas was unbelievable. Again, in September, when the fish used to be congregating, you would see the fish running the rivers. And it's in those kind of general areas that those four rivers still are that the best of the fishing is. And like we'll say, there's parts of the lake that wouldn't have had, you know, they would never have got, it's just too far away from those areas. And like the fishing is, can be dead in it, even in May, you know, even spent fishing, it can be just dead. And and again, on that podcast, you know, the last salmon, you know, you talk about it, look, we've gone habitat to death, like, and Jesus, we were, we were all doing the bits and pieces. And look, we probably weren't all doing all loads of different clubs around the country were doing stream rehabilitation stuff and you know probably 80% of it was the right thing to do 20% bad or maybe not the right thing to do but it was all we yeah anglers will go along with yeah we'll do what we're being told this is the right thing to do but it it hasn't worked it, it, you know it hasn't in, the, in most cases it hasn't worked like Cara had a hatchery um, you know, um, I, I, you know, talking to anglers up there, like the trout with the blue, blue dots on the head. Do you know, um, Cara, you know, Jesus, that's just such a shame what's after happening with Cara. But I, like, I don't know enough about the trout. We should probably get somebody on, Tom, in terms of maybe talk about the trout hatcheries. I, I'm not sure it's the one on Regan, but they, they were still able to, they, they had a loophole when the one here was closed. Re was still allowed to continue because there was technically still netsmen on Re fishing for trout. Again, I was talking to um one of the Dolans up there a couple uh, was it two or three years ago, but he was saying like that again, all the obstacles are starting to be put their way now as well. The only thing I would say just in the hatcheries, what I've learned um is well this is specifically I suppose in relation to salmon. Um like I don't know anything really in terms of the trail hatchery. So I'm going to like, I'd like to get an expert on to tell us the, the pros and the cons. And I'd love to ask, find out why did this stop in Mount Shannon? But like what summed it up for me in terms of the salmon was um, basically if you want to keep the wild fish in the river, you can't go down the hatchery route. Simple as that. So, you know, but I certain sense, you know, part of me thinks, well, it's a bit like, you know, trying to stop the tide going out because in terms of all the other factors that are going on, it's proven so difficult to stop the salmon numbers plummeting. And then the other side of it is as well, if you want fish for anglers, you can go down the hatchery route, but you're going to kill yeah. off the wild stocks yeah. in that river. So like my kind of, and I said it in the episode, I think it was with uh, Paul Whitehouse and John Bailey was where I said as well, could we do, both like where you have certain areas here is a wild river where you focus just on conservation and here's another river over here where you just focus on you give up on the wild fish and you just focus on the conservation or you focus on the hatcheries for angling um and to try and go down that road um 
I haven't still haven't got an answer to that. But really oh, yeah. interestingly, Ken Whelan, we have an episode with Ken Whelan uh, coming up in a few weeks. He's actually now calling, like, and you know, Ken Whelan's so renowned and respected as a fishery scientist. He's calling for. He's saying the science does exist if it's done properly, that you can and should be looking at having hatcheries. Now, this is for salmon in rivers because yeah. he says we, we've gone past the point of no return, pretty much. I think is what he was saying to paraphrase it like so that if we can do the science properly which is, has been proven in certain areas it can and it should work but i think the problem is when you talk to fishery scientists they'll go well you know that's a whole different kettle of fish because you're giving up on wild fish and conservation and maybe sometimes you you have to kind of hold your hand up and say yeah i think i have to but look brown trout tom we'll, we'll get into that i think in another episode it would be interesting i think it really would be interesting shane to to find out well, that was that was a rabbit hole we went down. Wasn't yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, it's <laughs> fascinating. Um, and I will I will include the link for people to read that uh, from twenty years ago. Um, it's free online on independent.ie to look at. Right, it's coming up to Mayfly season. What are you expecting, Shane? The season's been obviously dreadful in terms of the weather. Um, like, is it like clockwork that you know such and such a date you're expecting the Mayfly to to be appearing? Uh, yeah, like there, it's it's got it's got earlier and earlier every year. Now, look, the odd year will always will always throw it throw it back in your face a small bit. But look, we're the what are we um, coming up? I suppose the twentieth of April is you'll have guys will will be out fishing my flies. Um, you'll see in some of the areas there's probably three or four really area early areas of the lake for mayfly hatches. And um, yeah, the twentieth of April wouldn't be unknown to start uh, seeing good hatches of mayfly on dark. Um, so yeah, we're we're only uh, around the corner from it to be honest. Um, like we're renowned as being the earliest in the la- earliest in the country and the earliest by far. Again, like we've guys that would fish the carb a bit from you know a couple of the clear lads. They'd fish here and then head off to the car, but we've we've lost the lads from the Midlands will come down to us um into those areas at the start of it. Um give a couple of you know, give a couple of days uh on Derg before, you know, getting into it on their own lakes. Um so yeah, the around the twentieth, um, I suppose look from personal records, the twenty sixth of April is the earliest I've had a fish on the spent. Um so that'll give you an idea, like, you know, to get fish on the spent, they've obviously been hatching for at least a week. Um. So, yeah, and like, I suppose that goes against what it was historically, like, you know, the end of May, first week of June was always a good time. Um. You know, that was probably the, the end of it years ago, whereas now, you know, you could be, it could be, I won't say it'll be all over, but the best of it will definitely be finished by the tenth or twelfth of May. To two weeks, you kind of give it in or give it. Yeah, it's like it. it's like everywhere. Like I suppose, look, it's again, it's not renowned as a wet fly lake. You will start getting fish when the flies start appearing, um, on wets. But for the hatches of like, because traditionally here on the carb, you will wet fly will out fish anything else right at the start of yeah. the fly. You know, it'll outfish the dries and it'll outfish the dap, which it very rarely will yeah. do. And then after about three or four days, the other methods start yeah. coming in. Is it the same with yeah, you? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. You probably, and again, it's in the areas, the first couple of days, once the boat pressure starts coming, you probably have about three or four days before things start to get a bit tougher. Uh, so those guys that are out scout nearly, you know, they generally will have a good, a nice bit of fishing before the word really gets out. Um and before lads, you know, like again, most lads will wait till the first of May. But again, fly life or what I used to always say about uh fly rods down here, fly, fly rod was for the season, not just for May. So like that last week of April was <laughs> often better than any of the part of May. Um so yeah, like there's there, there's a yeah, the, the first couple of days like uh, and again, there's nothing special about it. Um, you know, your normal fellas will work, but stimulators will are really good. Um, yellow and gr- yellow and green stimulators on your on your top. What's a fantastic fly? Yeah. And Jesus, I I would have had 
brilliant uh, back when I was in college. Um, I, I shouldn't really say I was in college. I used to spend more time in the lake than in college, but um, <laughs> uh, it was basically it just a uh, it was something I saw in a Rod Kai article. Um, before the curtain rises was the name of the article. I've all the old articles in in bind in binders, right. yeah, yeah. But um, it was a carrot mayfly. Definitely taking it for a nymph, but carrot mayfly just with a French partridge, um, and two little, two or three little bits of sparkle, um, down along it, and that that used to be unbelievable for the first week. And after that, you wouldn't catch a fish in it, but right. it was it was deadly. Yeah, it was <laughs> deadly, and gave it to a few lads here, you know, and um, yeah, they all would have done fairly well with it. Um, then yeah, the DAP again. There's very few lads in our our club that DAP anymore. There, you will see a few around the lake, but the DAP is kind of gone. Um, unfortunately, um, like I bought. I was only talking it today with one of the girls at work they were talking about their son getting their confirmation and what they were going to do and they said I went down to Sadie Whelan's in Nina and I bought a fishing rod bought a dapping rod for my confirmation um, and I only ever dapped dapped three times once in the carob once here with um, a really good club member that um, uh, sadly passed away there Dinny Seymour um, and he managed to get me a fish but like I hit him as if I was hitting a fish in the dry fly. Like, I don't know how I got him. But, um, and Lock Lane, I actually dapped on Lock Lane as well. That, that That's a different story. You know, that's that's a lethal metal on, on Lock Lane. But, um, but, yeah, and then you're into, you're into your standard dry fly fishing. Um, but I will say, just from my experience, and again, the lads that I'm, I'm hanging around with, you will get fish. Somebody's going to sound contradictory, but you will get fish drifting. We're not going to see plenty of free rise of fish. They're, they're, most of the fish you'll get will be on, on the blind. So they'll come out of the blue. There's thousands of mayfly in front of you and you don't see a fish in the acre wolf. It makes no sense, but it happens. Um, but most, like, what, what, and if you talk to any of the lads from Durg here, anything above a ripple, the fish go down. They do not like it. No, there's days. Yeah, Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. There's days you'd be Jesus, that's kind of hard because you must get I mean, like it's a big open yeah. water. And it's it's rough, like it's rough. Like it, 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 you get big you get big rollers, like especially you know, on a yeah, yeah a big north you get a northern yeah, northerly or a big southwest, yeah. like there's very you know, there's a few places that you won't get out of. But um yeah, like some of those days you may pick up and generally speaking, you'll pick up a pig of a yolk. But you won't have consistent yeah. fishing. Um, whereas if it's a calmer day, the fish just definitely one hundred percent prefer a calmer day in that dark. They're more genteel. <laughs> they're more genteel than their carb cousins. Yeah, I, it's an outwest. <laughs> those wild ones outwest. <laughs> oh, yes, they're, they're, Christ, they're a lot tougher up here. Yes, I love it. Yeah, way. exactly. Yeah, our lads are a bit softer. All right, but um, I tell you, they're not softer when they fight. Like Jesus, they the power in the fish and the way they act. You know, again, you were talking there last week about getting a fish that was like a sea trout. Uh, Tom, or possibly was a sea trout. Yeah, some yeah, of our yeah. some of our yolks won't stay in the water. Like you know, um, wow. And then, like you know, again, a lot of the big fish. Like you get a fish over five pound down here, you're taking a long time to to land him um, you know you could be talking half an hour like lads have taken two three hours to get fish eight nine pounds in just can't get Jesus. can't get them up right. me being more rivers man I'm fascinated with locks they're just one step down from the ocean for me in terms of just <laughs> size and scope is your club is Gary Kennedy so that's uh, uh, midway kind of between Killaloo and Portumna that would roughly be right um, Shane yeah we're about okay. yeah we're about yeah, we, we wouldn't be far off. Uh, Drummoneer is probably halfway. Um, so yeah, Drummoneer is about halfway. I suppose, look, it's 26 kilometers, uh, 26 miles long. So yeah, we wouldn't be, yeah, we're probably about 10 or 11 miles from Bella as as the, the lake goes up along. But so we were on the south side of it. So um, yeah, G- Gary Kendi Club, like we've we've had a couple of famous guys in it. Um, Matty Kendi, Matty's Mayfly, Tom, ring a, 
yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, Matty, wow. Matty's Mayfly and Matty would have been renowned on Lock Mask and Melvin like and you know, he died and I unfortunately I never I never got to talk to the man uh, unfortunately, but he was renowned by and, and well liked by lads all over the country, you know. Um he would have won the yeah. World Cup. Um I think it was the biggest fish ever biggest fish part in the World Cup actually on, on Matty's Mayfly. Um Yeah. And he would have won a Melvin Open, I think. I, I might be standard corrected on that, but um he would have been one and I suppose um Sean Hickey, uh again long gone now at this stage, but Sean uh had the heaviest fish in Ireland in, in seventy four, caught on on the fly. Um thirteen pounder and he had a ten pounder in eighty four. And uh, just a, a serious man for probably before his time when it came to dry flies. So how does it? But you know, in terms of say, take the Mayfly, and I'm interested in this in terms of like, is there certain areas that you'll know as a club where, you know, compared to other clubs where you'll go in terms of like, I suppose I'm not trying to say is it, is there demarcation lines, but do you uh, have no. certain? No, there's not. No, I I like I suppose I, uh, a couple of the clear lads don't like seeing all our boats heading across from the carry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not, that's, a, the that's not a fishing thing. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, that's not a fishing yeah. thing at all. Shit. Nothing to do with fishing. Oh Jesus! Don't mention the war, but uh, they're, they're yeah. got... when, when they see the, the yellow bellies coming <laughs> over. <laughs> uh, but uh, I suppose look, the the wind direction has actually played a big part in that as well. Like we're getting, <laughs> we're actually getting northwest winds this time of the year. I don't know if you've noticed that that's. Yeah, but we have actually. We talked about end, that before. End of April, first two or three weeks of May, the predominant wind is not southwest anymore. It's nearly north northwest. So directly across from us would be the, we'll say the the northwest. You know, it, it it suits the north wind. Again, you're trying to get shelter. So look, there again the early spots like you have, we'll say down the Killaloo side. You have a place called the Fish Pond. Uh, it's Tinarana House, um, but it's known as the Fish Pond because it's like a little, a little inlet of the main lake. But that's one of the earliest places, like around Holy Island, Mount Shannon, another great place. Early doors, where the fish is consistently well throughout the month as well. Um, our side of it, we have uh, a place called that's known locally as Hockey's. That's is that's my way of keeping it secret to the locals, but. Everyone, everyone that fishes out there knows it. <laughs> but um, again, Drummondier has Luska Bay, Drummondier Bay itself, over by the windmill and the Iron Door. Here, you're predominantly, that's where your earliest hatches are. And as the month goes on, that's where your biggest hatches are. Um, but it does get well fished. You know, it, 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 like, it wouldn't, you could see, you know, you could see anything 20, 30 boats there around the windmill on, a, on a, any given day midweek or whatever doesn't sound like a lot of boats right. now for the car but um it's a lot of boats in one area do you know what i mean um but yeah the, is there lines i suppose there's a couple of lads would love to put a, an electric fence around their own base <laughs> um in and, and we have that up here as well yeah but and don't worry about it it's not that's not just doctor that's that's an everyday yeah, but i suppose look that's that's kind of more at the start of it. Then you have, look, you actually have good sedge fishing and I, I think an awful lot of lads probably disregard it. They will take dry sedges during May and there's some great areas on the lake to to, to get uh, right. sedge fishing. Um, yeah, the green fly is be phenomenal and I suppose when it does come to the spent, the spent can be anywhere and like you know, you're dealing with a huge expanse of water. Um, you know, fish can go spent anywhere. They can be out over 100 feet of water. They could be inside in three feet of water. It doesn't really matter. It's where the fly come to, you know. Um, so I suppose the, the 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 fences and all that kind of come down when, when the spent start going out. Like, you know, it's really predominant. What, what, <laughs> what way the wind is, is, is blowing, not being too... Uh, too basic about it, but it's generally off of your your wind, you know the 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 top of the wind, and and following the flies out, you know. 
And tell me this, um, like if people were interested in fishing the Mayfly, is it hard to get guides now that take out during the Mayfly season? There's there's two or three lads that I know that offer it. Um, offer it. I don't know how successful they are in getting lads out. I really don't know. Um, and I suppose this is where I'll be honest about it, right? Locked or, and, and look, Matt, Matt just said it as well. Like, I love the lake. I oh, Jesus, I love it. And mm. on its day, it's better than any Loch Corrib, any Loch Chelan. I would, I, on its day, it is phenomenal. Um, And you could have better fishing and the quality of fish is just unbelievable. Um, But I don't know, like, you, you're very limited. You, like, you're very limited in, in, in a lot of your fishing that, it's very tough to go flogging wets all day when it's not a great lake for free rising fish. You could be stuck in at the boat of one island for the whole day. And that's it, like, do you know what I mean? So I suppose would I would I pay a guide? And I and I do believe, um, and not just talking up to you now, Tom, but I definitely believe lads should pay guides. You don't care. And you we talked about the pike lads. The the pike lads in Ireland, the the the, the lads fishing for pike in Ireland pay two hundred fifty a head to a pike guide. The the pike the the trout guides who are putting in way more effort without technology and without all of this stuff. And you know, if an Irish lad is asked to pay one hundred fifty euros, like he's going, ah, Jesus, that's robbery. Like these lads know what they're talking about. Like do you know what I mean? So I I do look again. That's contradictory. I personally wouldn't pay for a guide in Loch Derg. Because well, I just think the it. fishing is is just too too limited. But again, on a day, if you hit it right with one of those lads, um, you could have a day that you'll never have on any other day. Do you know? Look, two thousand and nineteen was just a phenomenal year. I you know personally, I had a phenomenal year in two thousand and nineteen. Um, you know, I think it's I'd. Half a dozen. This isn't going to sound anti for Sheila, but I think at a half a dozen fish over four. Um, one I had my heaviest fish at, at five seven. Um, but like you know, my average, my average that month, and it was phenomenal. Like I, I, I don't think I'll ever repeat it, but my average that that year was about two and a half, two three quarters, and there was a, a a decent number of fish in it. Like, like your average fish on the lake is going to be probably a pound and a half to two and a half pounds, and any fish you get on Loch Derg that's over two and a half pounds is a serious fish. You've you've earned the right to to get your picture taken or take him home and eat him or whatever. Um, there there isn't you you'll see them, but trying to land them is trying to land them is is another thing. Like again, I mentioned there, just like guys can be in fish for hours. Not them, do you know. Is it fair to say, Shane, like in terms of the popularity stakes, Sheelan seems to be the one, isn't it? People are going and then it is Carb and then it is Dirk. But like you said, if you know where you're at, the potential is there. So, you know, maybe it's for the kind of anglers who kind of want to maybe, I don't know, something different, a bit more of a challenge. But yeah, like, if you get the rewards, they will be good. Like, like something different. Like, look, um, we're definitely the poor relation now compared to the other lakes. That's that's a fact. We don't get that many lads visiting. We get a few lads here and there. A couple of lads will come for a day and they'll feck off again like if they've had a bad day. It's hard to blame them. Like, you could literally walk out across a bay with the amount mm. of mayfly that's on it. Like there's there's a couple of bays here, like Yal Bay, Drummondier Bay, um some of the places on the clear shore. Uh Bonlahi, a few of these places like Mount Shan down around Holy Island down. Scarif Bay, you will get a hatch of mayfly. You will get more flies hatching in one day in one of those bays than you will on probably three or four other lakes around the country for the whole month. It's phenomenal. Like, Sheelan is the only one that can right. come near it. Um, but you may not see a fish break water. But then all of, a, all of a sudden, for a half an hour, the wind will drop, things will go calm, and fish will go bananas. Do you know, so it's it's a funny lake, like it's it's the sulkiest sulkiest lake you could get, but it is just it it's unbelievable when it does turn on. Lake doesn't get any hatches of olives at all, no. No, no hatch. It it will get a small hatch. Um, I've only seen it in one or two areas. Um, late in September. 
um, but not at your normal olive time of April. Yeah, you, you just don't see them. Yeah, which is a pity. And we get plenty of buzzers, but we don't get. They're they're not proper duck flies, and they're not proper candle. Or do you know when I'm saying that they're not the bigger ones, you know, that you'd be fishing with your tens or twelves, they're tiny little yokes. Um it, coincidentally, actually, on a really hot day, this is this is giving away some bit of a secret now. Uh the end of April, kind of start of May, on a bacon hot sunshine day, be armed with a couple of small blacks. Size six kind of size 14, 16, um, uh, just Plain, plain and simple, uh, plain and simple, small black. Yeah. So, career. I'm I'm fascinated to find out then, Shane, um, because I've learned so much about Derg fish and Derg. You've been really honest about it. It it's it's an amazing it's an amazing place, Sarah. And like with the with the spent, I know I said that it isn't as as good as what it once was, but on a calm evening with a fall of spent, you will see on like it is an amazing place with fish going everywhere. It is an amazing place. Um, some of some of my favorite evenings, um, and we'll always talk about, to always talk about is actually evenings you catch nothing, but you've actually you're bet down from actually covering fish. Do you know, so that's again that goes away from the whole sulky thing that I said, but like that's that's just being honest about it. It can be amazing, or it can be the sulkiest place on earth. Actually, just before we let you go, um, Shane, just in terms of the Gary Kennedy Club, um, it sounds sounds to be a very strong club, um, and you've got competitions as well that you're running on it as well, um, charity competitions as well. Yeah, um, look, I suppose, um, look, we we run competitions during the year, but um, back in 2018, um, I suppose, look, my mum had had gone through uh, a couple of battles with cancer, so. We've seen the look as many families have. They've seen the the plus sides of hospices and the care that that can take uh, that that families get. So, uh, just decided to start running a, a kind of a fundraiser, but a bit of a crack competition as well. Um, so just trying to get lads fishing with lads that they might fish with before, because I suppose that's one thing about Lockburg is most lads will fish in their own. Um and it's very it it's a very kind of solitary thing for the month. But look, the charity the charity thing is just appears. It's it's run on a it's not run on a catch and release, but it's run on a measure basis. So you can kill the fish if you want, but let him back if you want because it's run on everyone's given a measure board. We just try to do something you know different. We and coffee and a bit of a chat with all the lads so we've lads from the Clare clubs we've lads from the other clubs around a bit of a chat and it's it's generally the weekend before the Mayfly really kicks off um, yeah and that's it we donate all the all the funds um, to the North Cape Hospice there and um, so look it's it's ran ran since 18 it was really good last year um, and look Hopefully it'll be successful again now this year again. But look, hospices see Cornamon are doing one as well. Yeah. Look, there isn't yeah. a there isn't a family out there that 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 uh, I suppose yeah. hasn't been touched by it. So look, it's just something it's just something to give back. I suppose as anglers, we we're always trying to get prizes in from sponsors and stuff like that. This is just look, I put up the prizes for the lads that are fishing it, um, and anything that's any of the entries, any of the entry fees or anything like that. Any of the money that's donated goes straight to the hospice then. So um and they appreciate it. It might only be a small amount of money, but they appreciate every bit of it as well. And also I think what it is is it's great, um, is seeing the clubs involved in the local community like that, like you said, giving back, you know. Um and I think that it's just brilliant to see. Um and obviously by the sounds of it, the Gary Kennedy Club saying like you're so passionate about the lake and the water and the fish and it's you know, it's just it's just great to see and to hear that, you know, and obviously clubs like your own, that like the Gary Kennedy one are, are doing well and, you know, very yeah, proactive. Like, yeah, we have a good membership and we're holding steady, but like all clubs around the place, like um, just young lads, we can't get them. We can't get them. We've tried everything. Um, and I suppose it's a lot different than in my day. Like, like I owe, like none of my family fished, none of my uncles, none of my family, um, it was, it was all came about by following two of my friends to the river 
uh, at eight years of age. And then, luckily, two of the members here, uh, John Malone and Jim McCormack, if I asked them, could I go out with them on a Sunday, they'd actually bring me out. But there's no, you can't do that now, number one, um, with the child protection and stuff. But we've tried loads of stuff. Like we've gone to Jono's in Leach Anglin Centre. We'd, you know, loads of kids down there. We just can't seem to hold on to them. Um, but then we've lads that are coming back that might have, you know, in their early 40s, I'm in that bracket now. Um, but lads are coming lads are coming back at that age group when they have their own kids. You know, all the galliv- all the gallivant and all the sport is over and they're kind of coming back to it and it's a nice it's a nice thing they can take the kids out for an hour or two, you know, just something different, a bit of fresh air. So we are struggling that side of it, but we have a really strong pub. There's really good crack in it. Um again back in two thousand and five we started a, a weekend away. So twenty of us hit the road every End of August, we hit Parab or Mask or Con or Uncle Tommy's over in Lane. Um, and it's generally looked the fishing is good on a Saturday, Sunday. It's a bit slower, all right, for <laughs> some some reason. But uh, funny that, isn't yeah, it? yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah. it's it's mighty crack. It's it it's just mighty crack, and it's it's really good crack. Like we've we've had unbelievable characters in our club, down all through the year. And a lot of them wouldn't have been just locals. Some of them would have came from nine or ten miles away in Nina, the, the blow-ins. But it was great crack, great, great camaraderie. And you see that again with the hospice, uh, with the charity one. Like in Mount Shannon run a big competition as well the day after. So they come over and support that. We go back over and support their one. And I just think, look, sometimes we forget that it is a pastime that, you know, the yeah. seriousness sometimes takes over. Sometimes, and um, and look, I was I was one of them. There was uh, I mentioned one of them that used to take me out, but himself and another man, and he was only buried a couple of weeks ago. Um, Tommy Lord Morrissey, him. But I I had a thing I'd heard a guy saying, you know, um, that such and such a fellow was obsessed with beating the world, and I'm just obsessed with beating him. <laughs> and that was my mantra for a couple of years. Like I was, well, Tommy and Don are obsessed with baiting everyone. I'm just obsessed with baiting them. So, <laughs> but uh, great, you know. And again, like it, it, there was not never ever um, serious or anything behind that. But it was a healthy rivalry at the same yeah. time, you know. Yeah, and a healthy rivalry is good. No, I have to say now, uh, just hearing you there and and going back to the club, uh, it's really important. And you know. I've always said it, local clubs, you know, they're custodians, they look after the place, but also as well what you're doing uh, with the hospice, the fundraiser for that is after it's something touches my own heart as well. And as you mentioned, we run one up here in Cornamona as well, but no, so fair play to you for that. Um, so yeah, it's just amazing. Really, really good to hear about that. Uh, yeah. Shane, really good and really good uh, to what Dara said there. It's fantastic to hear. You've enlightened me in a lot of things about Loch Derg. And yeah, you know, things I wasn't aware of. It's great to hear it. Great to hear it. But um, so just leads me on before we wrap it up with you. So what was your most memorable fish on the fly? This one, yeah, I am all over this one now for, for a long time. Um, probably, I, I really can't narrow it to one. I, I, I have to probably mention two. Um, the, the first one, was I suppose with my my great fish buddy down here, uh, Podrick, in two thousand and nineteen. Um, I, I I got my heaviest fish in that bird. Like I've, um, I, like I've a lot of three four pound fish, but never could get over the five pound mark. And this day we were out, and uh, yeah, I got a, a fish of five seven. Like we could we we'd seen him from about thirty yards away. And in fairness, and I suppose this shows the relationship me and Paddy have, and the understanding we have, which is very important. Um, it was my turn to fish, and uh, it just so happened like this lad was mopping flies inside in about two or three foot of water, and I proceeded to cut off my fly, and retie my fly while the fish was murdering flies in front of me. So any other angler bear body would have shone at that fish. But he rode me into position and he kept asking me, are you right? And he started counting 
actually started counting the flies, the amount of flies that Vitch was eating. Like. <laughs> um, so when he got to 16, I had got my, the, the more he was counting, the more nervous I was getting. So anyway, we um, when he got to 16, I was right, uh, passed it, and he took 17, and then he took mine. And I don't know, was it a half an hour later I landed in and he, he weighed in at five seven. Um an immense real dark, a real old kind of a bruiser of a fit. He was but it was it was found I I thought that would never be met. Um and about three weeks later I was fitching that leads me on to my second one. So the the, the two of these happened in the space of, of three weeks of each other. Um First of June, I was fishing with a, a good buddy of mine, Larry, Larry McCarthy there in the Corrib, well known. Yeah. yeah. Uh, after Canis, and uh, we just turned off the engine and there was fish going. And first cast, had a fish 5'8", and that fish was the most pristine, perfect, thin, perfect fish I'll ever catch. It was amazing. Um and the other fella was so relaxed. Like I my my heart was in my mouth as soon as he took it, like and uh for the 15, 20 minutes it took me to land him on the on the light stuff. Um the other that I could poured himself two cups of coffee. <laughs> no bother, no interest, no interest in getting the net or nothing. Um and I to finally asked him to go, so I think he's ready there now, and he puts down the cup of coffee and he nets him and I have a photo of that fish. That fish went back. Um, but that, that just the, the morning light, that fish, he was 5'7 or 5'8. Um, I, I, I can't even remember. I was in the days that morning. It was unbelievable. Um, we went on, like we'd, we'd, we'd loads of fish that day, but those two fish were just amazing. I know the cliche to pick your two biggest, but um, yeah, it's just the fact that they were in such a short duration of each other. They were they were two amazing fish. Totally different situations. Um I suppose I'd given nearly thirty years trying to catch one on Loch Derg and the emotion that, that brought we I had, I had a right session for two days after that one. Um <laughs> but the one in Par of then was just was unreal. Um well I must say it was just unreal. So they're my they're my pick. Sorry I couldn't get it down to one fee. Oh, I'll, t- I'll take uh, those both. That, yeah, I think that's fair enough. I think you're well yeah. justified with uh, just going for two there now, Shane. I think so. If you have the pictures, we'll put them up as well, just so people can see the, the second one anyway. You said you have the picture of it. Yeah, I have. I definitely have the one of the car in its full glory. The one on, on Dorg, I think the only picture I've left of it, I have blue blue uh, lines to <laughs> cover the... Uh, the, the exact location of <laughs> yeah, there <it's> <laughs> and my, myself and Paddy uh, affectionately referred to it now as five pound corner so <laughs> nobody has an iota of where we're talking about but yeah. uh, the two of us know where we got all right that's uh, all that matters but look lads I suppose look thanks a million look that burg is always overlooked um, but as I said it's definitely worth a trip for anyone just it's a beautiful area couple of great pubs around the place as well and I think we, you'd be welcome to start talking about any sort of a mayfly at all to really someone who'll prick their ears at the bar and, and, and start talking about it anyway. No, definitely it's uh, I, look I think it's well worth revisiting and just reminding people of it um, and you know you haven't tried to you know airbrush it in any way Shane you know it's you've been straight up about it but definitely worth a visit for people and um, put it on your on your list again you know some year maybe if you're you know deviate away from car or or do all three, oh, all three. Yeah. tell the missus yeah. you're gone for four weeks six weeks whatever <laughs> <laughs> you have this important un- business to do unfortunately <laughs> them days are over there yes days i know i know <laughs> oh, oh to be one of the gentry back then <laughs> uh, yeah absolutely absolutely but listen i suppose look i appreciate i appreciate the days i go now which exactly. i probably didn't when i was younger um yeah. so Plus, the other side of it is I don't be I don't be uh, staying in the back of a Corolla when I'm going on my fishing trips anymore. I I I, I got, got into the too old for that. Stage. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Shade tight lines anyway for the Mayfly season, which is only around the corner. Um, hard to believe with the weather, but you know, let's hope it'll it'll be a good one. Thanks a million for joining us. Here's that. Mind yourself. Take care. I thanks to Shane Kramer for joining us on the show. Don't forget to rate, review, and follow. The Ireland on the Fly podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast from. 
Plus you can keep up to date on IrelandOnTheFly.com as well as on Instagram and myself and Tom will be back with another episode about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. Mayfly time is the pinnacle for most brown trout anglers and we're pleased to announce our next Ireland on the Fly Masterclass is focusing on Mayfly tactics with international angler, guide and renowned fly tire Jackie Mann. On Thursday the 25th of April at 8pm, Jackie will be discussing how to make the most of the conditions, the best flies and methods to use, as well as giving his tips and insights from a lifetime of experience. So, to join us for this masterclass on Thursday, 25th of April, just go to www.irelandonthefly.com forward slash masterclass. Tickets cost €10 and all attendees will get a copy of Jackie's notes as well as access to the recording of the webinar afterwards. And stay tuned for our masterclasses throughout 2024, covering salmon, rivers, locks, streamers, lures, dries, everything to make you a better salmon or trout fly angler, helping you to catch more this year and to learn from the best. For more information, email us on info at irelandonthefly.com.